Hello, I'm Harley Schlanger from the Schiller Institute. Welcome to our webcast with our founder and president, Helga Zepp LaRouche. Today is May 6th, 2020, and we're in the, the midst of a very tumultuous period in history, tumultuous and dangerous. There's been enormous pressure put on governments uh, around the transatlantic region to reopen the economy, to move out of the lockdown stage and social distancing. And there are some complications involved in this. Helga, what's your view of the situation surrounding this? Well, it's obviously that um, given the pressure from uh, the industry, the firms, you know, the people who are losing their livelihood around the world, one has to say the pressure on the governments to open up is indeed enormous. And the situation is for sure uh, not helped by the fact that you have a lot of disinformation uh, being channeled, you know, all the <clears throat> most uh, <clears throat> varieties of uh, fake news, ranging from that China is behind this, that they created the <clears throat> uh, uh, virus in a laboratory, to that Bill Gates is the <clears throat> originator of this uh, whole uh, <clears throat> pandemic to make a fortune with selling vaccines, to that it is only like a flu, and I could add um, to this list quite a number of uh, variations. But the reality is that the flu, uh, that the virus, uh, <clears throat> the coronavirus pandemic is really not under control. It is real. And people who don't look at the totality of how this affects the whole world are for sure not getting the picture right. I mean, there is right now, because of pressure from various uh, layers and sources, uh, an opening up, uh, both in the United States uh, and in <coughs> European countries. But, uh, you know, this is uh, not, uh, not a good thing at all, because uh, <coughs> as the virologist uh, Kekulé from Halle pointed to the fact, that a pandemic is not uh, a slow catastrophe, but if the wrong steps are taken, it comes like an explosion. And you cannot uh, <clears throat> open up the economy, so to speak, even so that's a slightly uh, strange formulation, um, <clears throat> without that alternative protective measures are in place. And these are not in place. Such measures are absolute testing that you really know what you are dealing with and that has not been accomplished uh, neither in Europe nor the United States, then you have to have uh, full uh, <clears throat> possibilities to isolate and uh, trace uh, contact. You have to have full protective um, measures like masks. You have to absolutely have protective uh, clothes for the medical personnel. And, you know, you, you don't know what you're dealing with. I mean, are the school children who are now supposed to go back to school, have they been tested? I don't think so. What about the Kitas? What about the role of uh, how the <clears throat> virus is being transmitted by children? There are big question marks and contradictory reports are coming out all the time. Now, I think that the uh, people who are questioning all of these points I just made are completely overlooking. I mean, please look at the figures or the picture as a whole. Don't just go by your wish that the weather is now getting nice, you want to get out, you want to have uh, go to a bar, go to a club, uh, and whatever motives people have to oppose certain health measures uh, being imposed. Uh, look at the total picture. And the total picture is that you had various so-called hotspots like Lombardy in Italy, like New York, New Jersey, uh, where you had more corpses coming from this pandemic than the uh, health uh, uh, institutions could, could, could bring away. So, you know, this is serious. This is not a flu. And I think it's, um, it's, it's uh, really a symptom of a society which where the population is so in large part hedonistic that they cannot accept the fact that you know this is a real virus 
and it is a pandemic and it has its origins neither in a Chinese lab nor in the evil thoughts of Bill Gates and, and such people, but it is the result of at least 50 years of wrong economic policies as we have warned since the early 70s that if you lower the living standard of large parts of the population, especially in the developing sector, that you invite pandemics to come because of the collapsed immune system, because of the malnutrition and all of these factors. So I really urge people to not go haywire, but to take the uh, the time and the uh, you know patience to really rethink this whole situation through. And you know the bottom line is that unless we change the unjust economic system, which is in the long term uh, responsible for this, there is no solution. A solution is possible, but we need a new credit system. We knew we need to have large uh, long term credit lines for real industrialization of the developing countries. And we have to increase the living standard of every single person on this planet. And that has to go along with the building of a health system on the top level, as it used to be with Hill Burton standard in the United States or the German or French system until the 70s in every single country. And unless you, you are willing to consider those real solutions Everything else is uh, looking at too short. One of the arguments you hear is that with the changing estimates of the death totals, including from the mo various models that are out there, that people are saying this just shows that there's corruption and fraud. But the fact is we still haven't finally gotten down to understanding exactly what we're dealing with. Uh, isn't this one of the great dangers? Yeah, this is a, a new virus and, uh, you know, the uh, estimates in the recent period from several medical experts is that it may take one and a half years or two years before you have uh, <clears throat> the ability of vaccines and naturally then all the people who are anti-vaccine go already uh, jump off their seat. But the point is, you know, there is a science to this matter. And you have to look at what China has been doing, why they were successful in containing the virus in about two months, uh, and why you know uh, they were able to restart their economy relatively quickly after uh, they contained the virus. Now, if you don't take these factors into, into account, uh, or look at what is going on in Africa, in India, in Russia, if you don't take these factors into account as a totality, uh, you know, you, you come up with the wrong solutions. And what we need is an international cooperation among all the scientists of all of these countries uh, to indeed find out what is the nature of this virus and what is the nature of other pandemics which are in, you know, in line. Because if we don't remedy the deeper causes, there is no guarantee that uh, there will not be another pandemic following this one even more uh, dangerous uh, than, than Corona uh, virus. So people should really understand that this is the moment where international cooperation among scientists and among all countries is the only rational way to go. And you were talking about this question of the economic aspects of it and the, the injustice. There are new figures that came out from the International Labor Organization on the informal economy, the numbers of people who have uh, hand to mouth existence. This gets right to the heart of the, the danger, doesn't it? Yeah, I think that that is something I would really urge all the people who are now upset about this or that aspect, what I said. The ILO, the International Labour Organization, uh, just published uh, new figures, which I think are extremely relevant in the context of COVID-19. And that is that of the 3.3 billion uh, people being in the global uh, labour force, 60%, that is 2 billion, are in the so-called informal economy and 86% of that are in Africa. Now, informal economy means that people do not get regular wage, they just get paid for the day. 
uh, they don't pay social uh, <clears throat> insurance, they, they don't get uh, health insurance, they just live from the mouse, you know, from the hand into the mouse. And, and once they are affected, like right now it is happening, that you have a collapse of the international food production because of the insane policies on agriculture coming from such places as the EU uh, Commission, uh, but also in the United States, where the effect that the entire food processing from the uh, sowing, uh, the spring season to the harvest, to the food processing, uh, <coughs> to the supermarket is all in the control of about five uh, super cartels. And their policy has been such that, you know, now you have a breakdown of, of agriculture. So we are looking at a dangerous uh, famine situation developing. And if the people who are now affected by <clears throat> the effects of the coronavirus pandemic, uh, if they cannot uh, go to work, they're dying of hunger in a few days. Uh, so I think that the only way, and I keep repeating that, because if the pandemic is now arriving in Latin America, uh, other Asian countries uh, like South, South Asia uh, and Africa, uh, you know, where you have already incredible conditions, like in Africa, you have the locust plague, which could have been solved about a year ago. Uh, but nothing was done when there was still absolute massive time to, to stop it. Now it's becoming a huge uh, problem in large parts of East Africa uh, on top of HIV infection, tuberculosis, malnutrition. And, you know, I mean, l listen to what the Prime Minister of Ethiopia is saying or listen to what uh, was discussed at the conference of the Non-Aligned Movement uh, which just took place. I mean, these are real facts and you have to consider them. Uh, the reality is that unless we change this present unjust economic system, which denied de facto uh, real economic development to the developing sector, uh, <clears throat> there is no way how you can stop that. And we are looking at a catastrophe. So please look at what we discussed at our recent Chiller Institute conference uh, a week ago, where we try to bring together the forces from all over the, uh, all over the planet uh, to form an alliance to fight for a new credit system, a new development perspective for the developing countries. And that is the only way we can possibly uh, change the conditions uh, of this situation. And people who are not thinking this through, you know, they come up with the wrong conclusion. And I think that that is contributing to the irrationality which we see now in many places. I think one of the most effective parts of the conference was the panel with American agricultural leaders who, in discussing the problems that American farmers were the most advanced in the world, what they're facing, we see the same thing happening in Europe and the same policies of the cartels taking, you know, destroying farms and, and taking food from countries that are food insecure. Now, uh, so if people can go to our website and, and watch that part of the panel, it's, it's very powerful indication that we do face a world food crisis. Now, Helga, you mentioned the non-aligned movement. They just had a meeting where they discussed the kind of cooperation that's necessary uh, what what went on at this meeting and, and what were the results? Well, I think uh, they concluded <clears throat> that uh, the non-alignment movement, which after all represents more than three quarters of the human species, that they have to take a larger role in defining what the uh, new order uh, following this pandemic uh, must be. And that is a very good thing because you know we that is the la rouge movement we have been working uh, with elements of the non-aligned mov movement since my late husband developed in 1975 the proposal for an international development bank uh, as the idea to replace the imf uh, and create exactly such a credit mechanism uh, for long-term investment in development projects 
Now, that was uh, the original intention of Franklin uh, D. Roosevelt. Uh, he wanted the Bretton Woods uh, to be exactly that, to overcome poverty. Uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt said, if there is uh, poverty anywhere on the planet, it, it threatens the security of the entire humanity. And he regarded the increase of the living standard of every single nation around the world as the precondition for a stable world order. Now, as we discussed uh, at the conference, and which was also discussed later on by, by Jerry Rose in a different program, uh, you know, that effort was unfortunately abandoned because of the untimely death of Franklin D. Roosevelt, uh, you know, in the uh, <clears throat> beginning of 1945. And then the actual Bretton Woods was determined and influenced by Churchill. Uh, and therefore, this whole idea of uh, providing credit for the development of the developing sector uh, was never introduced. But this is why we need a new Bretton Woods system, uh, which exactly takes up that question uh, of large long-term credit for real development. And, you know, I think the world, uh, if we get through this uh, present crisis without further calamities like war danger, which is also becoming a big factor because of the insanity of the geopolitical faction, uh, then the post, if we get through this, then the post-pandemic order must be one which gives justice to the developing countries. And it's very good that the non-aligned movement um, is now coming big into play and uh, will take a leading role. And that is exactly, you know, where uh, the idea of starting with a world health system uh, really falls on the most fertile ground. Well, this question of international cooperation has been at the center of everything that you've been talking about since the beginning of the year. And crucial in that is the relationship between the United States and China. And while there were some improvement with the phase one trade agreement at the end of last year and a very good relationship between President Trump and President Xi Jinping, there's now been unleashed hysterical anti-China attacks dominant in U.S. discussion of, of both the coronavirus, but also general strategic situation. Uh, Helga, this has come to a head in the, in the last week or so. Where do things stand right now in terms of the relationship between the United States and China? Well, I think it's very dangerous because it started with uh, literally the British uh, Secret Services, MI5 and MI6. Um, they started this line that, you know, China is responsible. Then you had the Henry Jackson Society sitting in London uh, making up a bill of what China supposedly has to compensate the world for in terms of uh, damage. Uh, but then, you know, it is absolutely naturally now uh, picked up by such uh, people as Pompeo, uh, Esper, Mnuchin, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, Navarro, uh, even, you know, uh, the... <laughs> Uh, previously sometimes rational Tucker Carlson who was defending Trump on the Russia gate. He is now one of the worst ones. Ted Cruz uh, and many, many other uh, people in the United States are really on a rampage blaming uh, China, either that they did not inform the world in time, which is a lie because, you know, I mean, we, uh, you can go back on our programs because we followed this extremely closely. Uh, I think end of uh, December, I think the 27th of December, China <clears throat> or somebody in, in Wuhan discovered some unexplainable cases of pneumonia. And one week later, uh, they, they informed the World Health Organization on the 3rd of January, the United States and other countries that they had a, a breakout of uh, a new virus. And then they immediately gave the genomes uh, codes to, to all scientific uh, laboratories around the world. So there is an undeniable record that China did absolutely nothing wrong. Uh, there was maybe a couple of days confusion of what this new virus was. But, you know, I mean, um, we had a case here in Germany where 
somebody came back from Wuhan, um, got pneumonia, uh, <clears throat> went into the hospital, was treated, and only afterwards, weeks afterwards, it was found out that he actually had coronavirus. So the German doctors didn't know what this was. And, you know, I mean, this is getting ridiculous. If you have a new virus, you know, it was, b before it is clearly identified that there are a couple of days on confu of confusion is absolutely uh, normal. So all this accusation that China was covering up and, you know, that even the Wuhan laboratory was the place where biological warfare was um, uh, conducted or, you know, t experimented with, uh, this is all ridiculous. The reality is China was able to contain the virus by locking down uh, people uh, for, you know, almost two months, 60 million people. Now, if you remember, in the beginning, uh, <clears throat> you know, the Western media, they said, oh, this is a violation of human rights. Uh, look at this dictatorial country. Uh, so they were uh, absolutely attacking China for taking these um, radical health measures. Uh, then, um, you know, they basically, uh, when they realized that China was not only successful in containing the virus, but that uh, they were able to restart their economy um, relatively quickly after two months, you know, and the West was not able, uh, and you have still now, you have this complete, you know, lockdown and many firms are going bankrupt. So to the extent that the Western societies recognized that they were not able to deal with it, uh, the British faction, that is the Pompeos and uh, all these people, they started to blame China uh, and say that China was responsible. Now, this is very dangerous because if you say that uh, basically a country which is also a nuclear power is responsible uh, for conducting biological warfare of, you know, this is building up an enemy image for a war. And don't kid yourself. Anybody who repeats that is contributing to what could, could potentially become World War III. Now, we are still one step away from that this gets completely out of control because President Trump, uh, while he blames uh, China, he has not yet gone all the way by saying this was a, a, a you know, an, an act of, of biological warfare, but it's very close. And, you know, Mnuchin said that Trump is preparing to punish China. So this is absolute insanity. And, you know, I think that the, uh, <clears throat> the this is a geopolitical game and you can see the role of the British in that, in the most clearest fashion, Reuters, they, they just put out a story where naturally, if you attack China and they start to react to that, then they say that there is an institute called Kika, uh, China uh, Institute for Contemporary International Studies, that they would have produced a report for Xi Jinping uh, discussing uh, many options, including a worst case scenario, which would include a military confrontation between the United States and China. And then they turn around and say, see, China is preparing this. But, you know, this is typical how the British are always, you know, provoking something, then turning around, playing all sides. And their main aim is to prevent a possible cooperation between Trump, uh, Xi Jinping and Putin uh, by, you know, getting the large powers together to cooperate, which is what we have been uh, <clears throat> pushing for for a very long time. And we are very close that Trump may get into the trap and then we are really in trouble. Well, there have been some uh, pushback coming from very interesting uh, circles. You had Neil Ferguson, a leading apologist for the British Empire who wrote these stories claiming that there were was massive international travel out of Wuhan after China shut down travel in and out of Wuhan internally. And this was completely debunked by Professor Daniel Bell. That story is available on our website. Uh, you also had a, a very strong op-ed in the Washington Post from the Chinese ambassador. What did he write? 
But this is uh, <clears throat> the Chinese ambassador uh, Sui uh, uh, Tian Ken, um, and he has an op-ed in the Washington Post today, uh, where he uh, basically, you know, uh, goes through this uh, story, you know, the evolution of the last uh, three, four months, uh, by basically, you know, really telling the record as as it was, and uh, in the end. Uh, appealing uh, that there must be a cooperation. Now, the story about uh, Professor Daniel Bell, I just want to uh, mention that because, you know, when uh, Niall Ferguson put out this lie that China would have sent these uh, bombs, you know, these infected patients uh, all over the world to, to, to infect the world, this Professor Daniel Bell just uh, started to look at the flight record uh, what happened to flights from Wuhan after January 23rd. And he could prove very quickly that all the flights from Wuhan were cancelled uh, and that, you know, none of these flights actually took place. So I think that this is uh, uh, very, very uh, important and people should really uh, not fall for these lines, but, you know, that, that really understand that it is... Uh, it is really the the rise of of China why you have all of these uh, people now going for regime change, including Matt Pottinger. You know, Matt Pottinger, uh, the deputy national security advisor, uh, has just uh, come out uh, and really calling for regime change, attacking the Communist Party of China, saying we have to have people to people uh, discussion. Uh, and calling for regime change, uh, all but by name. So, you know, it's uh, it's really something which, which has to be countered, and I'm actually calling on people to not fall into the geopolitical trap. Uh, you know, we have uh, on this coming Saturday, we have on the weekend the 75th commemoration of the end of World War II and the victory over fascism. And people should really have in mind that two world wars in the 20th century were called uh, were caused by geopolitics and if you go in this direction now uh, we could have a third world war including thermonuclear weapons and i don't think that there is anybody uh, who wants to be alive after such a war is over because you know many people who have studied what a thermonuclear war would be say the people who are dying in the first hours are the lucky ones as compared to those who make it a few weeks uh, later on so i really want to shake up people to stop this china bashing uh, and uh, come to reason and work together uh, as the only option and helga we come to a conclusion with a, a very interesting story that comes out of the German Constitutional Court in Karlsruhe, where there was a ruling against the policies of the European Central Bank, the bailout policies. And this could have very profound implications, not just for the European Union, but also by extension in the United States, where the Federal Reserve is going completely ape with uh, the most massive bailouts ever. Uh, what did the court in Karlsruhe say, and, and why is this significant? This is really an unprecedented uh, move because the Constitutional Court in Karlsruhe ruled that the measures uh, by the European Central Bank in the context of the public sector purchase program, which was this, uh, you know, this program that the EZ EZB could buy uh, bonds uh, by, they say, say that it's actually a, a bailout program for the banks, uh, that this is ultra virus, um, that you know the European Court, which ruled uh, that that was legitimate in an earlier case, that this was uh, outside of the uh, law of even the Maastricht Treaty, uh, and that it violates uh, basically um, the uh, question of um, you know who is the sovereign. Um, because neither the government nor the parliament checked into this uh, uh, buying of uh, the bonds by the EZB and that since they are not elected uh, and 
uh, you know, the ECB is not accountable to the voters, that this is a, uh, you know, basically a violation of the basic law in Germany. Now, obviously, there was a complete um, a freak out by the obvious uh, uh, extreme liberals like the former Belgian Prime Minister Verhofstadt, uh, the Italian Prime Minister Conte, uh, <clears throat> who naturally wants to have the bailout mechanism for, for Italy in place. Um, and, you know, I think this is very, very good. It's only a step, but it's the first time uh, since a very long time that there was a legitimate assertion of sovereignty on the side of an um, a, a important a German institution, the Constitutional Court. And, you know, I think that that may be a step in the kind of uh, re-establishment of sovereignty in the post-pandemic world where the question over you know the who who creates credit is it some private uh, interest like the european central bank for the interest of the banks and the speculators or is uh, the power to create credit coming back to the sovereign power of the nation state which is naturally what hamiltonian economics uh, would require you know because our uh, four laws the four laws of lyndon larouche uh, to imp implement banking separation, uh, Klaus-Stiegel law, then have a national bank, which gives uh, the power of credit generation back to the sovereign state, and naturally then create a new Bretton Woods system by connecting all these national banks of all these sovereign countries to an international credit system. And that is one step, but a very important one, uh, in the right direction, and I think that that is a hopeful sign because you know this casino economy, uh, where the uh, central banks are just uh, you know endlessly printing money uh, at the expense of the of the people, and that's actually what the Karlsruhe ruling also says, that you know that was an unproportionality that the uh, ECB did not consider the side effects on, for example, the people who have savings, the people who have real estate, the people who have investments, but especially naturally the, the savers, uh, and that therefore it's, it's uh, uh, in large part un anti-constitutional. So I think this is a very important development, and um, uh, I think hopefully it is the first step in the direction of reasserting full national sovereignty and uh, you know, redirecting the economy in the direction of the common good, uh, which has been abandoned uh, for a very long time. So I would say we are in a very fast moving uh, situation. And I would really urge people not to go off on all kinds of strange uh, theories, but to take the time to study what we have been publishing for the last 50 years. We have made many analysis of pandemics, of the injustice of the IMF and the World Bank, of Bill Gates. Yes, Bill Gates, we published a lot of articles about him, but he's not the only one. He is part of a system. And if you reduce a very complex uh, world to one name or you know, a, simple, a simple explanation, then you are not uh, catching what the reality is. The problem is that we are dealing with a British empire, an empire which has kept the population of the world deliberately in backwardness, and that system has to be replaced. It has to be eliminated. Oligarchism in all of its forms has to be finished. And you know, Bill Gates is just one element of, of that system which has to be replaced. So I would urge people go into our archives, look at the conference proceedings of the Schiller Institute of last week, and then you know get into the action to help us to bring through the solutions. Because if you don't discuss solutions, all what you may figure out is pretty useless. It's the time to change the system and not only to analyze it. Well, Helga, thank you for a very fascinating and hopeful 
uh, overview of the situation. Again, people should go on Saturday online, the SchillerInstitute.com, to the conference commemorating the 75th anniversary of the victory over fascism. Uh, so Helga, thank you very much, and I'll see you again next week. Yes, till next week.